Gaming has been a part of my life since I was literally five years old. Um, my dad actually put me onto Resident Evil, kind of controversial, but at the time I was just having really bad like night terrors. I would just wake up in the middle of the night just crying about like monsters in my dreams. And at the time my dad's an avid gamer, he still is. Um, he was super into Resident Evil and he's like, okay, how can I combine the fact that I want to play Resident Evil today and also maybe help with her nightmares? And he let me play, he let me watch him for a bit. And I kind of learned how to defeat the monsters in my dreams because I would shoot at the enemies in game and my nightmares pretty much went away. Uh, my name is Melanie Capone. I go by Mel in game and I am the in-game leader for Cloud9 White, a professional esports team. She's missed a handful of op shots so far, but if you hit one here, you may secure the round single-handedly and they collapse! Oh my goodness, are you kidding me, Mel? A few more players to go and has a good chance as to where they are. That is so insane from Mel. Would you expect anything else? Take that for Athena. So playing up with that mid area. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's so easy for Mel. Mel holding the angle. Needs to hit the opener shot. And she does. It's just down to the 1v1. And Mel does it again. She does nothing she can't do. Information on both players. Gets the first. Knows that KP's up top. Hits the headshot through the wall. I think I was first introduced to competition when I was honestly literally in elementary school. Um, my mom, she's an Asian uh, mother, and it's pretty much like you're competing against like all your cousins and all your relatives and stuff like that. You have to be super on top of your school, like I've done perfect grades. I used to flawless like the end of the year exams in elementary school, just like wouldn't miss any points on that. And then in middle school, same thing. She wanted me to get into like all like the programs, like the gifted programs and stuff like that. So even the school was super competitive, honestly. My first introduction to like competing in video games was probably like 2015 when I first started really playing CS:GO. Playing like a multiplayer game, I just the very first time I honestly played CS:GO against other people that could like shoot back that weren't just like bots. I had to kind of like think of what I had to do, which was a completely different experience. Like I said, I kind of get like a kind of rushed from it, honestly. Even playing at like Gold Nova, I placed like Gold Nova Master or something and I was just like so psyched and I was getting nervous in clutches. It just made me, I don't know, I feel like you were working towards something and you were grinding every day and versus like playing a single player game and you're just kind of like going through the story. I think I was 16 or 16 and I played at my very first LAN and that was like my first actual competition was also a LAN and I remember because my dad drove me 45 minutes just to drop me off with my keyboard and my mouse and he came to pick me up later that night. I honestly barely remember my reaction but I remember my mom's reaction and she was like he was gonna go to a place with a bunch of strangers and she was super worried actually about me and then meanwhile my dad's reaction was like Go you, let's go. You're gonna be like the, you know, like the only like 16 year old girl there. I think it's gonna be like an awesome time. Like you're gonna win, even though I was not gonna win. So LAN stands for Local Area Network. It pretty much means that there is zero ping difference. Everyone is geographically in the same area. So the connection between one person to another is, the difference is minimal. It, you can't blame the game for your shots whiffing pretty much. I've never seen so many computers in one place before. I literally had only played on my dad's computer in my like in my bedroom pretty much. I vividly remember I was like the only girl there. Especially I was the only like 16-year-old girl there. I think there might have been one other girl, but I I don't think we ever connected or anything like that. But the experience playing at LAN is unbeatable. Uh, I think the biggest reasons are kind of everyone's on a equal playing field. If you have a bad computer at home, for me, I had like 100 FPS. I come here 300 FPS. I'm getting pretty much twice as better performance. I can actually
play against people that have way better setups than me and everyone's on the exact same playing field with monitor, the computer, microphone, everything. And also the fact is the people you're playing with and people you're playing against are right in front of you. You can see their reactions live and having that kind of like psychological effect too is insane. Like you can feel the hype of your teammates, you can actually reach the highest highs and you can also feel like the lowest lows with your team. Um, you can see the other team tilt after you make like an insane play and you can see your teammate like jump up from their seat when you head into like an insane shot or insane clutch. For me, the biggest thing about competition is kind of like the challenge that you get actually playing against other people at a similar skill level. I enjoy being challenged and kind of like everything I do, and that kind of like scratched that itch for me. And also, I kind of enjoy the adrenaline rush from competing. I get like a huge kind of like dopamine hit whenever I compete, whether like I win or lose. Up until that point, up until the LAN, I was pretty much super heavy focused on school and gaming was just a hobby. A hobby that I'd done for my entire life that no one really knew about, but after going to that LAN, it completely, I feel like something like shifted in my brain after competing in like an environment where there's like 30 other people there and everyone's like super high energy. And then also playing the game feels completely different on LAN. It was super enjoyable and playing in like such a team environment. I think I realized that like something inside me was like, this is incredibly fun. This is something I would want to do one day. After my first LAN, uh, especially being the only like 16 year old girl there, I kind of looked out and I wanted to see if there was any other like women playing the game that I could reach out to because it was kind of like a, a lonely experience for sure being young and a girl and not seeing anyone else at that land and I would do some research online. I would come to learn about CLG Red and a girl named Mask. Mask pretty much was like the only woman to play at like the highest level in CSGO at the time. She played Premier, which is a step beneath going totally pro, which is traveling around the world. Premier is a pretty respected division to be a part of. When I first heard about Mask and I started doing research about her, I remember scouring the internet for like all of her interviews. I would try to find any press release I could about her. I was kind of, I was low-key obsessed, I'm not gonna lie. I remember what like astonished me the most and fascinated me the most about Mask was her ability to compete at such a high level and she was playing on co-ed teams with like notable pros that, that I knew about and she was the only one to do that. And seeing the interviews talking about how she got there, her work ethic, and how she had to pretty much take down these like these barriers, there's so many in front of her, was super inspiring. And I think there's a lot of those traits that I can see in myself today that inspire me to keep going and to keep competing. I'd always wanted to go pro since I was 16. I think a part of me has always wanted to kind of feed into the desire of, wow, yeah, I can play competitively in CSGO, I should pursue it, especially after going to these lands. I was thinking to myself like, dude, I would really love to do this for a living. I think what fascinated me the most about esports is at the time, I feel like growing up, video games and everything were very much taboo. Like, this is something that I enjoyed so much and seeing so many other people enjoying the very same thing and playing against each other, it just felt so like raw and it just felt so genuine, so authentic, like so happy. 
reality is at the time I was going to my junior year of high school, um, coming out of my sophomore year, and in American high school, junior year is considered the hardest year. Um, that's where you're taking your SAT, your ACTs, your big standardized tests to get into college, pretty much. You're taking as many advanced classes as you can to get college credit, and at the time, it's exactly what I was doing. I was president of Interact Club. I was in a bunch of extracurriculars. I was doing as much as I could in school with um, advanced placement classes, and it kind of, unfortunately, I had to give up the competitive side of things in order to get my grades up and ensure I could get into college. He's dropping more. In early of 2018, I started finding another way I could probably get involved into esports because at the time I didn't have a team. I was really strong with school, but I found another route in that there's a whole other story to esports that you don't see um, behind the scenes, production, camera work, videography, the people that control the camera when you watch majors and when you watch Kenny S hit an insane ace who's controlling who you're watching. And that's The Observer, the in-game director. And I realized that there were other routes that I could get into to continue my love for esports. If I had to equate observing to like in a real life example, it would be kind of not the cameramen that are watching, you know, you're watching football, you're watching the quarterback, you're following the quarterback make the play. It's actually the person behind all the screens saying which camera to go to. Like we want to see like Tony Romo throw this, we want to see like the receiver, all that. It's the person controlling the cameras, it's controlling exactly what you see. And the observer is just that, but in a video game, in CSGO. I'm pressing one to 10 different keys on a keyboard to show you exactly who you're gonna be watching. And on top of that, controlling camera angles, flying through the map, cinematic angles pretty much as well. In 2018, I actually think I discovered a game where I felt like I had like a, a real chance and a real opportunity, tangible opportunity to go pro. Uh, December 2018, I got into Fortnite. <laughs> if you watch that game, the mechanical skill required is mind boggling. I, I still to this day think it's one of the hardest games to play, one of the hardest games to master, and one of the hardest games to actually go pro in. Smiling, he's got the health advantage on Creo. Does. Folks, it might be time for the Shockwave play. Booga can soar up into the sky. Go for it, here it is! Shockwave to hide! Shots coming in! No elimination yet for the first game victory royale! I was playing the World Cup qualifiers, like these open qualifiers where thousands and tens of thousands of people signed up, and we were placing pretty all right considering how much time I played that game compared to others. And I really thought, I really sat there and I was like, wow, this might actually be my ticket to going pro. Game six, two a left. 1v1. Crew still in it, T-Chub as well, back and forth. And it might come down to a heel off. T-Chub dropping down those campfires. <laughs> we'll see here, Crew following it all the way in and T-Chub goes down. But ladies and gentlemen, there's no way anyone beats him. Your Fortnite World Champion, Booga! When I first met Roy, it was like a instant connection. work with Roy um, at Tulsa and at FRAG, and that's when I most notably kind of met him and started talking to him. I was an observer and Roy was a commentator, and if I had not observed that, I really don't think I would have ever interacted with Roy because commentators and observers are like part of the crew on a set and they interact a lot. And they kind of have like a 
a silent like kind of back and forth when you're watching a game where the casters will mention something and it's kind of like a cue for the observer to do something or vice versa. The observer will be very specifically holding on an angle or a person and that's kind of a cue to the casters to or the commentators to speak about something. And so there's a very kind of like a silent communication. There's a silent kind of synergy between the observers and the commentators. Meeting Roy and then moving with him was honestly a very fast process. Um, it was definitely heat of the moment. Like, the whole process was maybe like a few months of like meeting him in Tulsa and then moving in together in person. I did it because I kind of wanted to try something completely new. I wanted to completely dive into like a new country, a new college, and like, kind of like a big like long-term relationship I wanted to build. Moving to a completely different country when I was 18 years old was definitely a heat of the moment decision. But at the same time, um, there's definitely a lot of like rational and logic that it went into it. At the time, I was thinking about going into engineering at like UT Austin or uh, my local university, but college in the US is very, very expensive and I come from a very poor background. There was a college in Windsor, Canada called St. Clair College and it actually has the best esports program and extracurriculars in all of North America where I could study for a lot cheaper, a different major networking, which is very relevant to what I was doing because working lands, you have to get like the internet working, connections between all the uh, servers and all the people there connected. I could go to college here. It was very convenient. I could just live together with him and we could work together as well from the exact same space. When I moved here, we pretty much lived in like a two bedroom townhouse, one room where we slept and then one room where we did everything, work, recreation. We didn't even use the living room for anything. And whenever we were working, we were pretty much working together. We were working on Winter's League together. We were looking at a lot of stuff together where I was observing and he was commentating. It was kind of like a, a package deal where if you got one, you got two of us pretty much. And we'd be able to kind of use that to our advantage and sell that to tournament organizers where you can get a good deal that had good chemistry for pretty much a discounted price because it became as a package. So if he was working, I was working. And then if I wasn't working, I was waking up at 9 a.m. going to college. Yeah, but it's going to be on care, tripling down with the AUG. A nice break control right there. And it's all down to Ramoy now. One versus five. Surely an impossible scenario here. Yeah, it's really all down to that. Well, that's, a, that's a really sick smoke, though, from five balls. They have game control of a ramp, and that's a massive part of the map. Dealing with college, work, having no friends, being completely isolated, kind of alone until, you know, I finally met people in real life and made friends with them. It definitely took a toll on me. Um, it took a toll on my aspirations at the time, where at the time I was trying to get into Fortnite and work with Winner's League. I would come home just so exhausted and burned out. CSGO Winners League was like a tier two tournament organizer. They would host smaller tournaments compared to like a million dollars or something. Everyone knows if you play Fortnite, you know about the patches. They would just drop a game breaking patch like the day of a tournament, one day before a tournament, in the middle of a tournament. It was not very um, esports friendly. Winners League did end up offering us full time and we were actually getting ready pretty much to head out to Minneapolis. We were ready to move our lives to the US. We were looking at apartments for like a whole month and we were looking at how we were gonna save money and budget. We were looking at it pretty much, we were down to like the nitty gritty of, of everything at that point. So there it was, I was 19 years old and hoping to finally get my first full-time gig, about to move out. And we're just figuring out the logistics. Uh, okay, well, we can't sign a lease for another 12 months. So we have to stay somewhere for short term. And the most logical situation was, let's stay with one of our parents. And it made more sense to do it with his parents. Obviously, moving in with your boyfriend's parents is already a daunting task. But on top of that, at the time, um, his family's background is that they're 
uh, Christian Lebanese and this was something that is completely taboo. I was not married with Roy at the time. We'd been together for about a year and a half up until this point, maybe a year. And this was something they had never experienced before. Unfortunately, it was a lot more stressful than it seemed. Uh, extremely stressful because, you know, it is a bit crazy coming from their point of view, like, oh, you're a girlfriend and you want to suddenly move in and we've never even had a girl live here before that wasn't married. They've only ever had like the wives of his brothers come in. They've never even had like a girlfriend like live here. And that was definitely a huge like culture shock for them. And for me, there I was just kind of sitting there while, you know, Roy's discussing with his friends and trying to explain the situation. I'm just like, wow, I'm really in a whole other country right now trying to live somewhere for, just trying to find somewhere to live for a few more months. It was incredibly stressful. Eventually, you know, we convinced them that we wouldn't be doing anything crazy. We were just going to be there for a couple months, essentially. We had moved everything out of our apartment. We moved into his parents' house. We were pretty sure we were going to go full time in the US. This visa was going to get approved. And then everything pretty much fell through. <laughs> few months passed, it just started to turn for the worse. There was absolutely overwhelmingly feelings of like confusion and just in general nerves at what my future was going to be at this point. I was going to college for networking, so at the very least, if everything fell through, I could maybe work on like the LAN, at an actual LAN, I could help set up like the servers or do things where I'm setting up Wi-Fi, I'm doing IT for a company and still trying to work in esports. But regardless, it was so stressful and it was just nerve wracking knowing what my next step would even be. There came a point 2020, 2019, or something inside me was just saying that I, I needed more and that I just wasn't being completely fulfilled. The lack of fulfillment from observing, I feel like really is what led me to excessively taking notes of the game. That's when I would start watching games that weren't even relevant to Winner's League or any of the observing gigs I had at the time. That's when I started prowling ESCA forums and looking for any game, like literally tier three EU, semi-pro VODs and just watching LDLC taking notes and that's when I think it started becoming, it started coming back. I started becoming obsessed, honestly, with competing again. At this point, a game called Valorant was actually announced while we were waiting for the results of his visa, and the results weren't looking good, but a new, a brand new game that no one was expecting was teased it was as a competitor to CSGO. And that definitely, I feel like, changed the course of where we were heading. Have you checked out the new uh, Valorant uh, Project A gameplay video yet? So this is like the setup area. They're still in the setup phase. That's what the blue wall yeah. is, I think. So it's like, it looks like CSGO with Overwatch Ultimates. Uh, I'm gonna get the- Hold up, did she just request something and then he buy it? Oh my gosh, she did. It basically looks like CS, but with characters from Siege and Paladin's so level graphics. Oh, apparently you can shoot through corners of the walls. Okay. What the hell are we looking at? Oh, get me out! So before Valorant was actually known as Valorant, it was known as Project A in the beta, a couple months before its release. It was known as Project A, and it was advertised as this insane agent shooter that was more akin to CSGO than a game like Overwatch, where you have like full accuracy while you're moving. But instead, in Valorant, you have to be very precise with your aim. You need to 
be very specific about your movement. You have to be completely still when you shoot. And this is something that attracted a lot of the CSGO player base. When playing Valorant, it felt like a completely new slate. Right off the bat, Valorant to CSGO, the women's scene is completely supported by the developers of Valorant. Within a few months of the game's release, they instantly announced a 50K tournament, women's only, and I had never even had a chance to enter like a women's tournament in CSGO. There was no chance. And in Valorant, it was a completely different story. I had a very direct path that I could follow and go pro, essentially. ...reveal the VCT Game Changers program. This is an initiative designed to provide experience and a spotlight to elevate the women in the Valorant competitive community. I felt like if there was ever an opportunity to go pro in any game, to finally like pursue that drive inside me, it would be this game. I had a ton of hope and expectations going into it. So at a certain point in the Valorant beta, my mind shifted to less focusing on my individual self because I was confident that I could do what I wanted to at this point, that I was able to actually compete. The next step was building a team. And my dream at the time, my goal was I want to form an all-women's team, an all-women's roster, and compete at the tier one, tier two level. Keep in mind, this is something that has never happened at this point. This has never even existed in any capacity. CLG Red attempted it. That was like the only record we have. And I really wanted to emulate that in this game. I wanted to take it to brand new heights. And that's when I started searching and scouting for girls to join my team. And the very first person I reached out to was Jazzy Kins. Okay, they know they've gotten punished for it before. They know they need to try to win these next two rounds. Jazzy with the peak, taking the 3K. Oh, it's a light work for Jazzy Kins. Just point and click, all of these players from Sanrio is just walking into a crosser one by one. Oh, does it matter? Jazzy Kins takes it with the Guardian in hand, two headshots in, and the cleanup from Jazzy. And has the right angle and takes down four on the entire round. So Team Magical was built after we finally assembled all five. Jazzy Kins, she introduced me to Annie. She was a streamer, played Raze. She ran it down, loved her. I met Kat through Ranked. And Lexi is a longtime best friend of mine. I've known her for years in CSGO. You're on the defender side, and there's Mel for a third kill. You're right, or not Eco, but Mel not really using the best possible gun. He has an angle, and it manages to get two. Discord server, and we're trying to think of a new name. And Annie was like, "Why not magical?" She literally just combined all of our initials and made it into like a coherent word. And she made the logo, and we just ran with it. And that was that was it ever since. <laughs> Dude, Annie's just a giga troll. I love it. It's so good. <laughs> Magical did come out on top. That's the team of Annie Dro, Jazzy Cats, yep. <laughs> Alexis Marie, and Mel. Congratulations to them. That's a $50,000 win. As a team in Valorant, this was my first ever team in anything. I had never really been part of a set five person squad. And I think it was like that for a majority of the team outside of Jazzy and Lexi. What set us apart was ultimately all of us believing in our one goal, our one vision for the team. And that was, we don't want to just be the best female team. That was never once our goal. Our goal has always been to compete at the highest level that we can, tier one and tier two, always. And I feel like a lot of teams even now get stuck in that trap where we just want to be the best female team. Some people's goals are to only beat us and that's it. But we have never 
even considered that. We've always just wanted to play our best and make history. The other successes that I feel like we achieved was winning like a $5 tournament. We all streamed. Annie had like a huge brand as a result because we used to stream our scrims. This is early days, which is normal back in the day. And obviously winning FTW Showdown, which was the first Riot sponsored 50K women's tournament and we won it clean. The fact that almost every tier one org that you can think of, almost all of them reached out to us was so validating. It just felt like everything had paid off, that we actually had options. It wasn't just like, oh, we got to settle for something. We believed in ourselves and we bet on ourselves and everything paid off. Like a dozen orgs reached out to us and being able to choose, wow. I think uh, the rumors were they're going to get picked up by um, an organization soon, a top organization. It was insane. It was amazing. It finally felt like everything that we had all worked up to, not just for the months that we had scrimmed, but like for years, like from our childhood, like everything built up to this moment. And it was amazing. <laughs> After getting signed by Cloud9 White, I was so excited. And I remember having to contain that excitement for a whole month before we got announced. We had to wait like a whole month for the whole video to get made and all the clips and the awesome graphics. And I, I tried to leak it so many times, honestly. My whole team, we really tried our best to leak it. And people found out eventually, but waiting until the announcement video, I was just so giddy and excited for, honestly, to, to share it with everyone else. Um, we have, the biggest one in my opinion is C9 White. Uh, so this is formerly Team Magical. Uh, they uh, had some high-profile wins, specifically at the uh, at one of the Ignition Series. I think it was the FDW tournament, if I recall correctly. Uh, this is yep. comprised of Alexis Marie, Annie Dro, Jazzykins, Katsumi, and Mel. Finally being a team that everyone looked to in the female scene of being the best and having like noble goals. Obviously, we knew that was coming and it felt good to embrace it, but on the same token, one day the community loves you and the next day they hate you. You see people that want to see you fail and it's obviously an easy target being a woman in esports as well. People will specifically target you just for that. And obviously we all know that these things happen, but being on the brunt end of it is kind of, it just feels humiliating. It feels embarrassing sometimes and it just feels really discouraging. Something that I've always known as a woman is that if you are like in a male dominated space, you can't just be average maybe like some of your peers, you cannot be mediocre. You have to be above and beyond to get bare minimum respect, bare minimum that your peers already get by default. And that concept applies just the same in esports as a, as a pro player. I can't just be any other normal pro that's playing the game. I can't just be like any other tier two player. I have to IGL, I have to top fright, I have to be flashy, I have to, I have to do so much more in order to get the same amount of respect that someone else does just by default. The difficulties that I personally have faced have all been external with people. They're free on a fuck. What? The what? Did you say? I said the. Uh, oh, it is C9 said, Mel. Is that Mel? Is that Mel? Dude, I literally I was like, did you say? Role. Did you say you want to fuck? Said, do you? No, I said do you suck? Why would you like, say that? Like, are you bad? Like, do you I'm suck? Bro. Are you bad? That's cringe. What are you hey, saying? Go, wait, you're, you're, IG, the... you're IGLing, right? What the? You're gonna IGL us? Hey, you're this is all on stream, just letting y'all know. Don't say anything weird, please, don't! So a few months after FTW Showdown, we made the decision to actually make a six-man roster because we saw that Katie had actually shown interest in switching over to Valorant. Hey guys, Katie here, playing game name's Katie. I'm 19 and I'm excited to announce that I've joined the Cloud9 White Squad for Valorant. Um, Katie is a decorated player, um, a women's player in CSGO. She played with Mythic, which is a premier semi-pro team, 
and she was well known for having insane impacts, high stats, easily the best female player in CSGO. Unfortunately, after a few months, we went to Game Changers. Things were going well, but it was revealed to us three days, like a four or five days before the first VCT Open Qualifier of 2021 that she had essentially blackmailed and sexually harassed an observer in the community. It hit us like a fucking train. It came out of absolutely nowhere. I was actually, I was at a party or a get together and my Discord's blowing up on my phone. I was with Roy, I'm like, oh, I gotta go and take this. And I pretty much open the call and I just hear Kat and Lexi pretty much like crying and we're just like, they're telling me what just happened within five minutes. They are telling me like, Katie is blackmailing this girl and like threatening to like leak her nudes and she's acting like, it, it's genuinely out of a soap opera what was going on. We had literally just upset Renegades. We had upset E United. We just played X set. We were on like a upward trend. Everything is ruined. <laughs> Everything is <Everything collapsed>. <laughs> While I'm playing Valorant, it's kind of like an escape for me. I can follow the goal of trying to be the best in the world, but it's hard for me to ignore everything in my path. I'm dealing with my paralegal ghosting me. I'm dealing with a whole Katie situation that popped out of literally nowhere. I'm dealing with my family at home. Things like tensions are rising and bubbling. I'm not there to help. Things are happening at my actual home, where I live with Roy, where it's like, are we overseeing our welcome? Do we need to move out? Everything is just like coalescing into this huge just ball of stress. It felt like I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. I honestly felt like mentally I was I was crumbling. It was a whole emotional drama for me to just uphold that I was okay. I wasn't dealing with things properly. I wasn't taking care of myself out of the game. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't sleeping well. I had problems, a whole list and in one of our practice days, I feel like I kind of just cracked. I couldn't take it anymore. In the middle of one of our scrims, I had to take a moment because I couldn't breathe. It just happened randomly and I really try to, when I scrim, I try to think that nothing else is happening in the world. It's just the practice. But I feel like subconsciously, my body was telling me to stop. And in that moment, I couldn't breathe. I literally was struggling to have a pro I couldn't even call. I was in the middle of calling and I just, no words are coming out. And I paused the scrim and I just break down. That was the lowest point for me. Everything was raw and I was just at my computer. I was just not in control at this point. I was just crying, breaking down. I had an anxiety attack. I had, I think my first panic attack that I've really had. And after that, I think I developed an anxiety problem. In that moment, I had like a really random, like sober realization that what I was doing was not sustainable, that this is getting to a point where I physically cannot control what is going on with all the stresses and that I needed to take a moment to step back and deal with everything in real life. After what I feel like was the lowest low of that year, I thought to myself, I, I honestly didn't even know what to do at that point. I felt lost. But if there was one thing that I knew is that I would overcome and that, that there was no turning back and that I had to fix this. There was no giving up. This was the life I wanted to lead and this is what I signed up for and this is what I needed to work on next. After seeing a psychologist, after seeing a therapist, after opening up to Roy, after opening up to my team to like accommodate everything that I was going through, after taking the necessary time off and not just perma grinding 24 seven every single day, I feel like I was actually able to come to terms and at peace and 
kind of dissect what I was going through and the underlying issues, not even just what I was dealing with in real life, but like things that have been there for years and years that I've just ignored and repressed. I think the biggest thing I've learned about mental health is that it's not just me and that I'm not alone at all in this process. What I experienced was not unique to me and the best way possible. There's so many resources, there's so many things I can look to to help me get out of this because this is almost a universal experience. Like, you're not alone. There are other people that have experienced this and there are ways to get past this. You are not doomed. You are not unable to pursue a professional career or go to school or make friends or just even go to the grocery store. There are ways that you can use and things that you can do to be better in the future with your mental health. And I feel like that for me has been a journey and it's not linear at all. I'm not just like, oh, perfectly better now. There's definitely lulls and it's just as much a journey as anything else. I've been so grateful to have an amazing support system around me in my highest highs and my lowest lows in the past few years. My mom has done a complete 180. She used to be kind of like a disapproving, you know, Asian mother where it's like, go, oh, go to school, you don't get to play games, to she unironically made a Discord account by herself, joined my Discord and tracks all my games. Not just my games, but the other day I wasn't even watching Roy's game because I was in practice and my mom's messaging me and she's like, oh my God, Roy's game is so close. So she's by herself going to the stat website to find these games and watching it on her own. She's gonna complete 180 and she's just such a, a rock for me. And next to that, my boyfriend Roy has been I can't even begin to describe. Like he's been an absolute anchor for me these past few years. I I don't think I'd be here without him. He has helped me so much. I've had like middle of the night, like panic attacks or the panic attack that I mentioned previously. And he has been, I can't even, he's been an angel, like actual angel. He's helped me so much. And especially with him being an IGL as well, I feel like we bounce off of each other really well. And he's just, he's just amazing. My greatest inspiration for leading me to do all of this and to not only be like a women's player, but a respected one and one that is a role model in the scene and is trailblazing and is trying to get this message across to like younger women in gaming or even just women in gaming, women in esports, getting them to compete, it would be masks. That is who she was for me. And that's what I wanna be for all the women and the girls that come after me. I just think back to like my inner child and I always think of like six-year-old me, 12-year-old me, 14-year-old me and like what they would think of me now and would they be proud of you know the woman I've become and the person I am today and I think that is really what inspires me the most to keep going is like through all like the lows just knowing like this is something I've always wanted since I was young and I've been a gamer my whole life I've been in esports since I was like 15 and knowing that Everything I do now is like culminating to like this person that I've kind of always wanted to become. It makes everything worth it. It just makes me want to do more and try harder every day.